Brothers and sisters, our text this afternoon is 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. Let's read those verses again. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. After the sermon, we'll respond with the singing of hymn 72. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, John, the son of Zebedee, is an old man. The time of writing this epistle, he could easily have been 80 or 90 years old, but you wouldn't know it from his writing. The way he writes, it's a man in his prime, and of course, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. But he's old enough to have seen some, some major changes. It had been decades since he last saw his Savior descending into heaven, and what followed were some beautiful years spreading of the gospel of the crucified and risen Savior. And, and that gospel spread like wildfire in a couple of decades from Jerusalem throughout much of the Roman Empire. But there were changes as well. The Apostle Paul had warned the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20 that fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Now, John could have lived 20, 30 years after Paul, and he witnessed these very things happen. And at least part of the church, and probably even his beloved Ephesus. It was a sad and harsh time. There were people in the church who said that Jesus is not the Christ come in the flesh. And who needs him anyway to pay for sins? We don't even have sins. And meanwhile, these same people demonstrated arrogance, a loveless attitude, and a schismatic behavior. It unsettled the church. People were wondering whether they were even walking in the truth. And that's why John writes this epistle to encourage and, and to comfort the congregation. And as we read together, John says, you know the truth. You've always known it. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God who has come in the flesh. You know it's true, and you need to believe in him. And, and you need, through faith in Jesus Christ, to live a life of righteousness and holiness. And that's indeed the context uh, around our, our text. Just before our text, we, we read about those born of God, practice righteousness. Immediately after our text, John writes, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Everyone who is born of God shuns sin. Now, in the middle of that, we have our text. It's generally agreed that the words in our text are a parenthetical passage, which means it's kind of like between brackets. That doesn't mean it's unimportant, but it's like time out. You know, John has been talking about some, some harsh things, terrible things. Time out. Take a deep breath. Things are good. We have a Savior. And that's not just an abstract concept. We have a Savior who is real, who redeems us, and, and, and who transforms our life, both for today and forever. That's what we're going to look at this evening under this theme. Consider how lavish is the love that the Father has showered upon us in Jesus Christ. We'll see three things. What we are, what we shall be, and what we ought to be. John starts our text with, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Now, John doesn't, doesn't just point out the, the wondrous love of God, but he says it's love 
with a purpose, that we are children of God. When you hear this, if that tugs at your mind and you say, this makes me think of something, and so many of you are theologians, I'm sure you're thinking of it, you think right back to Genesis 1, when God created man in his image, created man to be his child with a purpose. That purpose is, is wonderfully summarized in Lord's Day 3. God created man good and in his image, that is in true righteousness and holiness, so that he might rightly know God, his creator, heartily love him and live with him in eternal blessedness to praise and glorify him. It's the crowning piece of God's creation, creating man as his image, his child, with the purpose of having sweet fellowship with God. But we quickly see that man was not interested in God's purpose or being the image of God, and he chose to follow Satan instead. The fallout was catastrophic. Instead of showing the image of God, man showed brokenness, hostility, broken relationships, violence, love of immorality, love of money. But the most amazing thing is God did not turn his back on man. He gave his promise, and then one day God came in the person of his son. And that son, our Lord Jesus Christ, was made to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God and to cause us to be born again, restored as God's image. John wrote about that beautifully in the beginning of his gospel, where he says, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God, through his son Jesus Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit, has restored man as his image a new birth, a, a, a life with purpose to live in fellowship with God again. Now, John is thinking of these things as he's writing our text. And what John is saying here, he has said over and over for decades and decades to countless people, and now he's an old man. Does that make the message old for John? Oh, no. What he writes is pure rhapsody, I tried to summarize it in this way. Consider how lavish is the love that the Father has showered upon us in Jesus Christ. You see, when John writes, see what kind of love, he's actually using a word in Greek which means from another country. Today we would say it's, it, it's out of this world. The love of God is out of this world. We've never seen anything like it. We certainly couldn't expect it. It takes your breath away. It leaves you gasping and, and, and amazed. It's like what Paul wrote in Romans 5 about, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is a unique brand. Love for the unlovable, love for sinners, love for the enemy. God gave his own son to death on a cross to restore us as his children and have fellowship with him. That's amazing grace, how sweet the sound. John is writing that God loves us with this incredible love in Jesus Christ so that we are called children of God. And lest anyone thinks maybe this is just something that we have in name, he quickly adds, and so we are. We're genuinely born of God and that, that has impact on our life now and eternally, as we'll see further in our text. Now, this raises a, a, a nagging question. If God's love brings rebirth in the blood and spirit of Jesus Christ, so that we're back to the original design of, of paradise, of this world, why don't Christians get more respect in our world? Why is there so much hostility against the church and against Christians. And we're not talking hypothetically here. In our own province, we've recently had, had a, a government that threatened the freedom of religion, the viability of our Christian school, because we would not toe the line according to their standard of sexual mor morality. 
Last week, just last Thursday, we had a pro-life rally. And the anger, the hostility, almost the violence of, of pro-choice people as if somehow we were attacking a woman's body. That's overt hostility. There's also the kind of hostility where the world just says, the church, so what, who cares? I don't expect that the media is gonna be here this evening to see the prayer service for the upcoming synod. And I don't expect the media will be present the next week or two either you know, to see what's happening in the Canadian Reformed churches. And if they were, I can only imagine what would be reported in the news, especially if they sit in while we're talking about sister church relationships and other churches in our country and our world. The headlines would be, what a sectarian elitist group that these Canadian Reformed people think they can decide who's in and who's out, who's true church and who's not true church. Why is there that kind of hostility in the world against Christians and against the church? John writes, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The world has a different father than we do. I remind you of a passage in John's Gospel, chapter 8, where we read that the Jews were so hostile to Jesus, they wanted to kill him. And you can almost hear the exasperation in Jesus' voice where he says, look, if you know the Father, then how come you don't believe in me, the Son? And then Jesus explains the reason for their hostility and their rejection. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. As long as the world has as its father, the devil, it will never know God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It will have no interest in the Word of God or the morals, the ethics that are found in God's Word and in His commandments. We can expect that the world will be hostile. We can even take comfort when the word is, world is hostile because as our Lord Jesus Christ said, if you're my friend, if you follow me, the world will hate you. Take up your cross and follow me. The hostility of the world indicates to us that there's something right in our lives. We're following a very different path. At the same time, we know that the Father is always with us, taking care of us. Of course, understanding this also makes us empathetic to the world. The love that God has shown us is undeserved. It's a love out of this world. Should we not also love the world? To be kind, to be caring, to reach out and, and hope that they will come out of darkness into the light of our Lord Jesus Christ? At a pro-life rally, our reaction to pro-choice shouldn't be anger, a race fist, a violence, but it should be listening, and kindness, Trying to find that moment where we can talk together and share what we believe and why we believe it. And I even think of a, a work at Synod, I'll take an example. Uh, General Synod Edmonton will have to approve the choice of a new professor, professor of New Testament. There's a choice of a professor who will train men for the ministry, men for the mission field, also men and women for mission aid and Bible translation and, and, and so on. We're choosing a professor, not just because we're thinking of the Canadian Reformed churches, but we're thinking of the world. How can we effectively get the gospel out into the world? There's a care. They may be hostile to us, but we care for them and pray for them and strive to reach out to them. In this way, God's love abides in us and is perfected in us. Now that brings John to a further glorious truth, and this is our second point. There's no denying that there's hostility in our world against Christians. At the same time, it's a beautiful world. And John says that in verse two, beloved, we are God's children now. We are God's children now, hallelujah. I mean, how, how much more awesome can we get 
than that. But John says, but even better things are, are in store for us. We are living in the, in the time of not yet. We're living in the gap. But a day is coming that will take our breath even further away, a glory beyond anything we can imagine. Again, God's purpose for our life is not to leave us in a broken world where we're surrounded with hostility and by our own sins, but he is taking us to a city whose architect and builder is God himself. Now, it is true that there's some uncertainty about what the future holds. John makes clear in his words, what we will be has not yet appeared. And what John is saying there is that some things haven't been disclosed to us. We're not surprised to hear that. In 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul talks about that he was caught up into heaven in, in a vision, he says he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. And earlier in Corinthians, he talked about what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. There are some things that cannot and will not be told to us. It's like Moses said in, in uh, Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong to God, the revealed things belong to us and our children forever. Of course, in all of this, we get a peek. When Paul says, I saw things that I'm not allowed to share with you, then we say, it's got to be good. It's got to be absolutely amazing and, and, and breathtaking. So we don't know entirely what the future holds, but we understand it's going to be amazing. The tears will be wiped away from our eyes. It will be a world without hostility, without sin, death, or pain. Now, this is what John tells us. When he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Now, the question is, who is he? Because John has been talking about God the Father, but we know that it is Jesus Christ who will appear on the clouds of heaven. Some commentators get so frustrated with John and say his, his language is imprecise. And it is imprecise. Calvin he wrote about that when he said, there is indeed an imprecision in the language, but the, but the apostle preferred imprecision to not declaring what needed to be known. We need to work with John to understand what he's talking about. And John can be very fluid when he talks about the person of the Father and the Son. And that's no surprise, because the whole point in, in his epistle is that the Father and the Son are one. You can't have the one without the other. And when our Lord Jesus Christ appears in the clouds of heaven, we will see the glory of God in his face. They are together. But what an amazing promise we have here. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like Jesus Christ, just a little less than God. It's hard to believe. A missionary once wrote that when he was in the mission field and people came to faith, he used people of that culture and language to translate the Bible into their own language. And when this man came to this passage, we shall be like him, he laid down his pen and he said, no, it is too much. Let us write, we shall kiss his feet. It is too much to imagine that we shall be like our Lord Jesus Christ. Reminds me of the tax collector in the parable who wouldn't look into heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He could not imagine that there could be a relationship between God and a sinner. But there is in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the truth is, the Holy Spirit tells us, is that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. It is as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. When the trumpet is sound and the archangel calls and our Lord Jesus Christ appears on the clouds of heaven, it is in seeing him that he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And through the power of his Holy Spirit, we shall be so completely transformed that we are free from, 
from sin in thought, word, and deed, and we're able to truly and perfectly be holy even as God is holy. One of the beautiful things about John describing all this is that John doesn't exhibit any kind of a spirit of escapism. This, this world is so bad. Let's get out of here as fast as we can. It's true. It's a hostile world. I have friends in China who have been beaten up and thrown in prison. Every week we hear of Christian churches and Christians being bombed and murdered. I am, I'm haunted by the 300 Nigerian Christian girls who were kidnapped and raped and lives destroyed by the Muslim Boko Haram. And on top of that, my biggest struggle, I'm sure yours too, is that we're never entirely free from our sinful nature. We can't stop entirely from sinning. Will it not be beautiful when we are free from this? Yes, it will, but we are here now. And we are here as children of God, and we have opportunities to live to the praise and the glory of our God. It's a lot like Edmonton weather. We've had a brutal winter. Spring has been spotty. In the cold and snowflakes are still falling, you hear the sound of a robin. The bud is turning green. The grass starts growing. And in the rustle of dry leaves, there is life. There are things about our world that are hostile, that are dead, that, that are depressing. But there's light. There's joy. We have the forgiveness of sins. We have our families, our church community, a synod that can gather together in freedom. There is life, beautiful life, here in this world. And as Christians, you have that magical balance of being able to enjoy life here in this world and know that the day is coming, that it will be truly perfect and awesome when Jesus Christ returns on the clouds of heaven. Now, lest such a, a rapturous and heavenly-minded description of Christ returning on the clouds of heaven uh, draws us away from reality, uh, John pulls us back when he says in the last verse, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So John here brings everything back to its context. Those who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior who are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit who live a life of righteousness, a life of purity, a life that, that fights against sin and wants to keep the commandments of God. You notice that John transitions from communal references, we are God's children now, we shall be like him, to the individual thrust, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. Ethical demands are for each and every Christian, no exception. Everyone born of God practices righteousness. Everyone born of God is pure, even as he is pure. The question is, how are we going to fulfill that? And John says very clearly, that's, that's in Jesus Christ. We purify ourselves just as he is pure. Now, you could understand that as saying, well, we follow the example of Jesus Christ. And he set quite an example during his life here on earth. So day by day, we could ask ourselves, what would Jesus do and follow his example? There's something to the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, but it simply isn't enough. It doesn't help me. It can't change my life. Jesus isn't just our example. He is the means. He is the foundation for rebirth, for holiness, for, for being pure. It's when Christ in his, uh, is in us and we in him, that transforms lives. And, and really what John is getting at 
you know, the opposition is saying we don't need Jesus the Christ. John says you, you absolutely do. And the closer is your walk with him, the more he will lead you in the pathways of righteousness. Now, how do we do that, brothers and sisters? You know the answer. It's through the word of God. It's people who love the word, who love the preaching, who love to read the Bible, and not just read it, but meditate on it, reflect on it, try to understand it. What does it mean for, for my life before the face of God? And then with prayer, that is life transforming. People who, who immerse themselves in the word of God come to know Jesus personally as their Lord and their Savior. And that's, of course, a message for all of us. But this being a prayer service for a general synod, we realize there's also a, a special message here for the brothers who will be at synod. They have some major decisions to make. Some are very joyful. Some may be sad. Some may be very difficult. How are their decisions going to be pure? How are they going to glorify God? How are they going to benefit Jesus Christ's church gathering work? It is when these men are men of prayer. Men who every day, also at Synod, are opening God's word, asking the question, what is this saying to me? What does this mean for me? And bringing it before God in prayer. When, when the brothers at Synod are standing firmly in the word of God, when they're praying, when they're drawn into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that will make their word, their work, pure and a blessing to the churches and to the glory of our God. It's not our brains, our wisdom, our hard and fast thoughts. It is our relationship with Jesus Christ that will always be our guide. And it'll be to the glory of a God whose love is out of this world. It gave us